Everything's written down here, you see? Births, marriages, and deaths. Here's your name, Mother. Oh, Elizabeth Dodson. You know, Bessie, it's almost 20 years since I married you. Come next, Lady Day. Oh, Bessie, you were a pretty lass then. Don't bear me ill will, woman. I meant to do well by you. We promised one another for better or for worse. But I never thought it would be so far worse as this. Don't fret, Mother. Tom won't be home any quicker if you stand by the window. Oh, but he should be home by now. The sale must be over. It's been dark for over an hour. Oh, you'd best busy yourself, woman, getting up some more port. One bottle's not enough to get merry on. We've not had a family celebration like this for years. I just keep thinking. It's our own they've been selling today. I suppose something went wrong. Oh, you always were a worrier, Bessie. What can go wrong? As soon as Guest and Co showed an interest in the property, all our problems were solved. Why, I even had a letter from Neighbour Dean saying he'd be at the sale bidding in person. Sit down, Mother dear. You look worn out. The mill belongs to guests. No, father. No? Uncle Dean bid for guests till they reached their limit, but, uh, well, he hadn't been authorised to go beyond a certain price. Someone outbid him? Lawyer Wakeham. Oh, no. Oh, father. Wakeham owns the mill. Yes, father. Oh, my God, forgive him. For I never shall. You've not at all. Wakeham spoke to me. He's offered you work, Father. He wants you to run the mill as an employee. We may only stay on here in the house on condition that you work for him. Oh, don't be proud, dearest. Accept his offer. Why, well, I think it's most generous of Mr. Wakeham to offer you your job. Generous! Generous woman! Oh, that's what they'll all say. Wakeham's a fine gentleman who didn't really mean to do me any harm. He's broken me! He's more devil than man! No, please, you'll be ill again. There's pen and ink on the desk, glass. Fetch it to me. He's made a beggar of me, Tom. And now he offers me charity. I shall never forgive him for that. Oh, I shall serve under him, mind. I've no option. I shall put my neck in the harness and work honestly for the scoundrel. But I shall never forgive him. Now, open the bottle and hold it steady while the boy writes. Right. Ah, here in the Bible. And you'll read it every day of your life. But what am I to write, Father? You're to write that your father took service under lawyer John Wakeham, the man who ruined him. You're to write that I shall never forgive him and that I wish evil may befall on him and his family. Father, please, it's wrong to bear malice like You'll put this. down that accursed lawyer John Wakeham and his twisted son. Father! And you're right that you'll never forget as long as you live what Wakeham has done to your father. And that one day, you'll have vengeance. And you'll sign it with your full name. Thomas Tulliver. Right! Right! to be baked. Hurry up. I'm almost ready, 
dearest. Are these the books? Yes. Fine, I'll take them out to the cat. Would, if I'm strong enough, it'll take her the rest of her life to read all these. Stephen. Oh dear, that tone of voice. Already I know it so well. You have something important to tell me, yes? I simply wanted to say that there's no girl in the world I love as much as Maggie. So I do hope you'll like her. Oh, Lucy, is that all? How feeble. I might be calling on her quite often. Well, I'm sure we're in for a very stimulating time. I can picture your cousin quite clearly, fat and bond, with big blue eyes and a mouth that's always open. Am I right? You have such confidence in your second sight, I shall refrain from destroying it. Uh, Lucy, dearest, please, don't be sharp with me. You can be very cruel sometimes. Forgive me, I'm begging. Only if you promise to like Maggie. <laughs> oh, Lucy, you angel. I've not read one of them before. Are you starved of books, Miss Tulliver? I'm very fond of reading. Well, then Lucy and I must bring you volumes and volumes. How is Uncle? Oh, so much better than when you saw him last. He was upset by the sale, of course, but I think he's resigned to it now. Can he move without the sticks? He went to the bridge and back without them last night. How <laughs> splendid. Am I to meet your parent, Miss Tulliver? Well, that depends on how long you stay, Mr. Guest. My parents have gone to Le Cref in the gig. A gig? How energetic. Stephen. Do you know, Miss Tulliver, that this designing cousin of yours told me you had blue eyes and blonde hair? <laughs> you were wicked to deceive me, Lucy. Oh, Stephen, how could you? You said that about her. Well, I wish I could always err in the same way and find the reality more beautiful than my preconception. Well, now you've proved yourself equal to the occasion, Mr. Guest, and said the right thing at the right time. Well, however tried the compliment, Miss Tulliver, it can nevertheless be true. Perhaps you would prefer me to be more eloquent. On the contrary, if a compliment is eloquent, I always treat it as an expression of indifference. Maggie, dear, you've always said how much you'd love to be admired, and now Stephen's complimenting you, you're angry. I love to feel admired, Lucy, but somehow mere compliments never make me feel that. I see no reason why a woman should be told with a simper that she's beautiful any more than an old man should be told he's venerable just because he's 80. Oh, I shall never pay you a compliment again, Miss Tulliver. Thank you. I shall take that as proof of your respect. Lucy, dear, would you like a sherry? Well, uh, Mr. Guest? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. I'll get the glasses. Stephen bought a volume of Purcell's songs this morning in St. Ogg's. And we were hoping we might persuade you to come back home with us so that we can all sing together. Stephen has a splendid voice. Oh, Lucy, well, that is not an impartial judgment, do you understand? Maggie shall judge for herself. Oh, I'm no judge, Lucy. I think any old barrel organ sounds splendid. <laughs> Maggie! Oh, bravo, Miss Tulliver. You disapprove of me. Oh, I'm just difficult to please, Mr. Guest. Any gentleman who thinks he's good enough for Lucy must expect to be severely criticised. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, dear. I did so want you to be friends. I, I've never seen Maggie like this oh, before. Lucy. <laughs> yes, well, she is much too fiery for me. Not my type of woman at all. Mr. Wakem. Would it upset you if we talked? I wanted so much to talk to you again. I'm surprised you remember me. It's so long since we met. In Stelling's study, we sat in the window seat. You haven't forgotten? No. Nor I. You always come here alone? Yes. It's called the Red Deeps. Strange name for such a green place. It used to frighten me as a child. Now I love its peacefulness. Oh, Maggie. Dear Maggie. Dear Philip, all these years I've thought of you and wondered where you were. Please, don't be angry with me for calling you Maggie. I, I'm so used to calling you Maggie in my thoughts. How could I be angry about that? You're much more beautiful than I thought you'd be. Oh, uh, I, I don't mean to say that you weren't beautiful then. I'm, oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I was just a little gypsy with my hair always and scowling at everybody. Oh, when you laugh like that, I see that you haven't really changed at all. Everything is different, Philip. I'm sure Father and Tom would be upset if they knew we were talking now. They feel so strongly about your father. 
Especially now he owns the mill. But would it really make their lives much harder if we were to meet sometimes? Maggie, it's not right to sacrifice everything to other people's feelings. But father is so ill. I'd give up a great deal for my father. But not a friendship. How strange it is to meet and talk like this. Just as if it were yesterday that we parted at Lawton. If you'd just let me meet you sometimes, I'd be content with only once or twice a month. Surely just to walk and talk could injure no one's happiness. Do you know the end of the lake where the ripple joins the floss? Beside the ruin? Yes. There's an old tumble-down summer house there I sometimes go to. It's so quiet and peaceful. We could meet there? No one would ever know. Well, say when? How soon? Which day? Tomorrow? <laughs> oh, Philip. What a joy it is to see you again. I feel torn in two, brother. We have 300 pounds of your money and now you need it so badly. Yeah, we need a lot more than 300, Aunt Gritty. To pay it back to you, brother, we must sell our farm. It was madness to lend it that way, Mr. T. And without security, I'll be bound. Father, they must keep their home. They have eight children to feed. There was security. Aye. What security? My husband gave a note for the money. We intended to pay it back when times got better for us. Has your husband no way of raising the money, Mrs. Moss? It would be a little fortune to a bankrupt. Oh, Mrs. Tulliver, if it would help, I'd sit up half the night and work. There's my poor boy working himself into an early grave in that rough warehouse and earning a pittance for it too. And Jeremy Tulliver tells us now, as calm as you like, that he's got £300 tucked away. It's downright wicked, Jeremy. Oh, Mother. Look at him, Mrs. Moss. He's aged ten years in the last month. That warehouse is no proper place to be, a young man of his education. I'm very glad to have the work. But you don't know what bad luck we've had. We are stuck this year. Yours is a very unlucky family. The more's a pity for us. Be silent, Bessie. Leave it be. The farm suffering, brother, as it never did before. We've sold all the wheat and we're still behind with the rent. If you had a note of hand for all that money, Jeremy Tulliver, why wasn't it produced to help pay off our debts? Bring the tin box down. Well, I think I sold all my china and, and linen. And Maggie could have kept her precious books. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hey, Feather, if this were found, the people you owe money to would force Uncle Moss to pay this whether you wanted that to happen or not. Then they must never find it. Well, Feather? What would you do, boy? Well, if, uh, if you said nothing about the promissory note, it must be because you didn't want to distress the mosses with the dead. You must destroy it, Father. Well said, lad. Do it. Oh, brother, are you sure? Do it. Making away with the note! They'll send the constable on us! You're a good man, Jeremy. I'm a sick man, Gritty. One day we shall pay back every penny, note or no note. If there's a God above, you'll never be the poorer for this. Oh, you do provoke me, Mr. Tulliver. Three hundred pounds in little pieces. I've a good mind to stick them together again. Hand them to me, Mother. There. I hope you're all satisfied. Ah, uh, this is the last. The proper beat, Mr. Tom. It's not right you have to work at Guest Warehouse and the mill as well. Ah, uh, well, until fellas well again, someone has to help Luke with the work here. Well, you'll be getting out with it. And then what good will you be to man the beast? I'll be all right. <sighs> have you ever thought about doing a spot of trading on your own account, Mr. Tom? Trading? Oh, by sending out a bit of cargo to foreign ports. I have a friend who's doing a little business for me in that line. I'm sure he'd be glad to serve you on the same footing. <laughs> You're a very annoying fellow, Bob. <laughs> ah, sir, that I am. <laughs> me to live inside like an odd cheese. <laughs> if I didn't have me dog to talk to, I'd get top heavy and tumble into a fit. <laughs> well, go on then. Tell me a bit more about this trading venture. Well, it, it's it's me some stuff I'm thinking about, Mr. Tom. Well, they're mostly light and take up no room and just right for ship cargo. Now, there's this man called Salt and him, with a good little vessel. And he knows good markets he can sell to overseas. Well, when freight and commission are cleared, you still make 10 or 12%. Now, uh, you give me the money, 
say, uh, 30 pound, and I'll go to Laysom and buy some goods for you, along with me own. Uh, and what's your percentage for this? Mr. Tom, I didn't offer to get you an apple just so as I could have a bite out of it myself. No, but you must take something for the business you put my way. Never you fret. Tending your 30 pound is me own will make me look mighty big in Laysom Market. Aye, but where am I to get 30 pounds? And where is your own money, Prow? I earn a pound a week now, aunt, and all except the price of my clothes and dinner goes back home to father. We've had uh, favourable reports from your Uncle Dean, Tom. He's talking of raising your salary. It <laughs> appears, after all, you're likely to do the family credit, Tom. And without causing it any expense or trouble. I trust your sister, too, has overcome her juvenile errors and general disrespect. How much would you require to borrow? Well, if I could have, say, uh, 30 pounds to begin with, I'll pay 5% for it, and then gradually make a, a little capital of my own and eventually do without a loan. It's not a bad notion, Jane. And this Pac-Man, this Bob Jakin, is he to get his percentage too? No, Aunt. He wants none. I oh, know that's bad thinking, Tom. He should have a percentage. I've not much opinion of transactions where folks do things for nothing. It, it, it looks bad. i better talk to him. Oh, he's waiting outside, Uncle. You'll not go out there, Mr. Glegg, and be murdered in the dark. Murdered in my own garden? Don't talk nonsense, woman. <laughs> you, you need fear nothing from Bob Jakin, Aunt. I've known him ever since we were little boys. Come with me and talk to him, Uncle. Examine his plans. You'll find they're all very sound and business-like. I've already a notion to start you off 30 pounds, Tom. And if Mrs. G wants to join me with another 20, well, that'll make a pretty good little nest egg, eh? You'll kindly let me do with my own money as I wish, Glegg. Very well, Darius. We'll do without your 20 pounds. It was only a suggestion. And now I suppose you want to shut me out of my own nephew's business. I never said I wouldn't put my money up. I just don't need you to tell me what to do with it, that's all. Be telling tramps next where I hide the silver. Will you or won't you put the money up, Jane? Tom Tulliver, I am the head of the family on your mother's side, and when I'm laid in my coffin, you'll know it and respect me for it. Are you ill, Aunt? Ill? What's the boy talking of? I never felt better. What are you talking of? You spoke of dying. For years I've been laying by guineas for you, young man. Full weight guineas. If I should choose to give you some of that money now, I hope you'll always bear it in mind and be grateful for such an aunt. And pay me interest. I don't approve of just giving, mind. No. I'd rather you lent it, aunt. And take interest. That's the Dodson spirit. Very well, Tom. Shall we away to see the friendly Pacman? Will you tell your father, Tom? Well, no, Anne. I'd rather see the look of surprise on his face when I give him all the money to pay off his debts. Huh. You see, whatever you may think about him, father's always done his best for us. Well, he's, he's always favoured Maggie, even when we were very small. <laughs> That's the way with fathers and daughters. Mothers prefer sons. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see his pleasure directed at me for a change. I want to hear him say that he's proud of me. I think I deserve that. Come downstairs, Maggie. Come down! Close the door. Right, now then, where have you been? I've already told you, walking. In the Red Deeps. Have you the remotest idea what the time is? No, I can see you haven't. Well, it's tea time, Maggie. Indeed, it's long since past tea time. Well, surely Mother always gets... Mother, as you have clearly forgotten, has been with Aunt Pullet all day. And that father's been calling you for the last hour. Oh, i better see what he wants. Not until you've heard me out. No, it is not right, Maggie, that all the work should be on my shoulders. I work too. Oh, you're teaching up. Look, Rep only occupies you two days a week and brings in next to nothing. I almost never see you helping Mother about the house. And when you need it here more often than not, you're somewhere else. Am I to have no leisure? No leisure? Oh, my God, you spend hour after hour mooning about the Red Deeps with your wretched books. You should be working harder to help the family, not burying your head in some book. Yeah, you see? Mother back already and no tea prepared. Or perhaps you'd expected me to do it. Oh, Tom, don't be so unreasonable. Oh, my. That gig! 
Your Aunt Sophie takes to the whip like a creature demented. I declare she'll have it over one of these days and not a soul surprised but herself. Where is Aunt Sophie? She went on, dear, to Sister Gleg. She's give you a lovely blue dress. I'll fetch Timo. Oh, that's a good girl. I'm fair worn out with clutching the seat of that gig. Why does that silly woman have to drive so fast? Oh, Maggie, take my shawl and bonnet, child. There we were, coming down that forest road as if the hounds of hell were snapping at Sophie's ankles. And what do you think happens? That poor twisted boy of Lawyer Wakeham's comes scrambling out of the Red Deeps right in our path. The Red Deeps, did you say? How we missed him, I don't know. Your Aunt Sophie said a word I sincerely hope she doesn't know the meaning of. And I just closed my eyes and prayed. Oh, drop that girl, she's forgotten her bonnet. I'm so late. I'm glad you came. Yesterday was desolate without you. Oh, Philip, I'm so sorry. Did you think I'd forsaken you? I was worried, dear. It's the first of our appointments you haven't kept. You had cause to be worried. Thomas found us out. Oh, no. How? What happened? Yesterday, he never let me out of his sight. I only managed to get away today because I knew he had an appointment in the dogs. But he certainly knows. He said nothing, but I'm sure of it. Oh, Philip, dear, on Tuesday, Mother saw you in the Red Deeps and she told Tom. And he's too clever not to realise what's been happening. Well, what has been happening? We simply meet to talk and be with one another. We've done nothing at all to be ashamed of. I know, but if Father should find out, Philip... I think I know what you're going to say and I implore you not to, at least not yet. If we must end our meetings here, let's talk of it when it's time for you to go. This afternoon is so still and perfect. Let's be selfish for just a little while and think of nobody but ourselves. Please. May I? Only if you let me see what you've already done. Certainly not. Turn your face to the light. You're such a coward. Do you think I should scoff at your word? Turn your head away. I shan't be able to do a thing if you look at me. Have you sat for a portrait before? Never. I think you have. Sit. Do you remember all those years ago? In Mr. Stelling's library. You painted this way, you were still at school. It's only a watercolour sketch. What an odd child I was. And how plain. I remember that old print dress very well. If I kept that little girl in my mind for so many years, didn't I earn some part of it? Strange that you should remember me all that time. When we'd only known each other a few days. Did I not say to you then that I thought you cared for me more than Tom did? And did I not say that you could never love me as much as you love your brother? First thing I remember in my life, standing with Tom on the riverbank, while he held my hand. Philip, if you should ever see Tom, please don't... Tommy Wakeham, this is what you call acting the part of a gentleman. Is this your crooked notion of honour? You've been spying on us. I waited outside the school this afternoon. And followed me? Yes. How dare you take advantage of my sister's ignorance and stupidity? Wait, you're the one who's stupid. You come bursting in here with your insolent abuse. How long have you been meeting like this? For months, here and other places. Ah, oh, the Red Deeps, yes. Yes, we walk together, Tom. What harm is there in that? I'm incapable of understanding what I feel for your sister. Get out of here, Wakeham. And if you dare to make the least attempt to come near Maggie again, or write to her, or keep the slightest order in her mind, you runt. I'll thrash you within an inch of your life. I'll hold you up to public scorn, Wakeham. My God, who wouldn't laugh at the idea of you as a lover? You coarse, narrow-minded life. You can't begin to understand, stop. can you? You might stop us from meeting, but you can't stop us feeling the way we do. Get out of here, Wakeham. And if you dare to come near Maggie again, I'll tell Father. But you couldn't be so cruel. It would kill him. Very likely. So you'd best do as I say. Maggie, dearest, we knew it would happen. For Father's sake, I must. If he knew I was going against his strongest wishes by meeting like this with a Wakeham... I understand, dear. Don't say any more. Oh, for God's sake, go, man! Or do you want me to throw you out? Trust me. I shall never change my feelings for you. I shall always believe that we'll be together once again. You animal, Tom Tolliver! You can't banish me forever! Philip! I despise you, Tom. 
I'm only submitting now for Father's sake, not yours. The matter's closed. No, it's only just begun. Today I've seen you as you really are. Come on, I'll take you on. All your life you've reproached other people. You've always been so sure that you were right. But you haven't got a mind that's big enough to see anything better than your own petty aims. Well, you've always enjoyed punishing me, haven't you? You've never forgiven me anything, not even as children. Because you've no pity in you, Tom. No love. And it's a sin to be as unforgiving as you are. You're nothing but a Pharisee and I hate you for what you've done today. Very well. If that's the way you feel. I've no wish ever to speak to you again. <laughs>